Good evening, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Welcome to our Daniel and Revelation seminars this evening. Uh, before we begin our nightly uh, quiz, why don't we pause for a short word of prayer? Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much, Father, for this beautiful Sabbath that you have allowed us to enter into. Thank you, Lord, for getting us through this week. We know, Lord, that uh, we've been learning so much here during our Daniel and Revelation seminars. Uh, Father, we pray, Lord, that the things that we learn, the things that we read and hear, will be also the things that we also keep. And so, Lord, uh, we ask, Father, for your spirit to be present amongst us tonight, Father, as we uh, study your word. And we just want to ask, Father, for your Holy Spirit once more to be our true teacher, to lead us and to guide us into all truth, that the truth shall set us free. Father, please speak to our hearts and uh, give us wisdom and understanding from on high, for we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so are you guys ready for the quiz? <laughs> All right, so same thing as, as normal. We're going to have three quiz questions. And uh, the, quiz, the questions, whoever answers or has the answer, feel free to raise your hand and come to the front. We have a microphone coming around. And uh, we will also give you guys some prizes. But unfortunately, we didn't bring the prizes tonight. So uh, what we'll do is we'll take your, na your names down and then we'll give you the prize tomorrow morning. I hope that's okay with all of us, amen? Okay, so uh, we apologize for not giving you the prizes immediately, but in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. All right, so let's start off with our first quiz questions. Uh, the first question is, True or false, if my Catholic family member attends church on Sunday, he has the mark of the beast. True or false? If my Catholic family member attends church on Sunday today, he has the mark of the beast. True or false? Is there any hands? It's a 50-50 choice, and the answer is on the screen. Would anybody would like to try? Oh, thank you. Is there anyone? Any hands? Is this a hard question? All right, we have someone here. Go ahead. False. Is she correct? Yes, she's correct. It's false. We'll, we'll look at the answer together. Um, so please. Uh, write down your name and give it to mom, and or I hope that we all know who wins uh, the questions, and we'll make sure to give you a prize um, tomorrow. Let's look at the answer. It's false. We can only receive the mark of the beast when the beast, that's papal Rome, forces the world to keep their Sunday holy with a death decree attached to it. And if we choose to accept this day as the Lord's Sabbath, then we will receive the mark of the beast. Does that make sense, everyone? So today, currently, if we have a family member that is going to, that is attending church on Sunday, it does not mean that they have the mark of the beast. Can you say amen? And the reason why is because God has given us the three angels' message to call people out of Babylon. Amen? And inspiration tells us that thousands who are in 
Babylon who are worshiping on Sunday will come out of that church and join God's true church. Can you say amen? So keep note that it is not the mark of the beast if they attend and worship on Sunday, if they keep Sunday, wor uh, if they keep Sunday holy, but it's when the beast, Papal Rome, enforces the whole world to keep the Sunday holy, which is the false Sabbath, then, and also they have this death decree that if you do not keep the Sabbath, I mean, Sunday holy, then you would be killed. And if that person chooses to accept that day, the Sunday, first day worship, then they will receive the mark of the beast. Does that make sense, everyone? Amen. All right. Question number two. What are the three components of the seal of God? What are the three components of the seal of God? What three things does a seal have in order for it to be an official seal? What three things or three components? What are the three components of the seal of God? Any, any takers? Any hands? Anyone? Is there a hand? Okay, there is a hand. Here we go in the front. Name, title, and territory. Is she correct, everyone? Yes, she is. Let's all see the answer. Oh. All right. The three components of the seal of God are the name, that's God, the title, that's the creator, and then the territory, which is heaven and earth. These are the three components to a official or an official seal, the seal of God. Amen. All right. So we will note... Uh, these two winners that we have so far, and then we have one more question after this. Here is question number three. Congratulations, by the way. Question number three. Which of the Ten Commandments is the seal of God found? Which of the Ten Commandments, there's only ten, the seal of God is found? The fourth. The fourth. Correct. Is she correct? She is correct. The seal of God is found in the fourth commandment, that's the Sabbath commandment, when it says, For in six days the Lord God created the heavens and the earth. You see, the Lord God, uh, the Lord God is the, the name, and then, I mean, sorry, yes, created is the title, creator, and then the heavens and the earth is the territory, which is the title that God rules over. God's saints will be Sabbath keepers in the last days. Can you say amen? amen? Amen. So the seal of God is found in the fourth commandment. All right, at this moment, we're going to have uh, Renz come up and share the message for this evening. God bless. Happy Sabbath, folks. Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Sabbath. It is a joy to say Happy Sabbath because I'll be honest with you, this is the first Sabbath, actual Sabbath worship, where there's actually audience that I am par participating in. Because for the past two months, it was either through an online meeting or in PIC, we would be, you know, we would be participating, but there's no audience. So this is the first time for a long time, for a while, where I actually get to worship with people. Amen? Yeah. Amen. So tonight, I'll be talking about 
So what did we talk about last night? The seal of God. The seal of God. Last night was the seal of God. On, um, and tonight is the counterpart of the seal of God, which is the mark of the beast. Now before I go on, I just want to say, this is one of the most sensitive, soft, um, very vulnerable topics that anyone could ever talk about. And I just want to say that I'm not here to offend anyone. I'm not here to, to say anything bad about anyone. I want to share you a story. Before we pray, I want to share you a story. Does anyone know? There we go. Does anyone know this man? Anyone have any idea about this man? I hear some people say, it's, this man is one of the pre presidents in the past of the United States of America, and his name is Abraham Lincoln. Now, what is he commonly known for? He was known for being the person who took away slavery. He was the one who stopped slavery during his time. And you can imagine, as someone who is living in a country where majority of the voters are living in a way that they are accustomed to, which is slavery, he ran for president when majority of the people were against him. Majority of the people were, didn't like what he was running for. He believed in freedom. And one of, he, ha he has many great quotes and one of the quotes that he says is, my concern is not whether God is on our side. My concern is to be on God's side, for God is always right. He knew in his heart that even if the whole world were against what his beliefs are, as long as he knows in himself that what he believes is aligned with God, then he is completely satisfied. So again tonight, what I'm going to say or what I would like to share to you is not something that I know many people will agree on or something that many people may be offended, but it is something that I know is from the Bible. And it is something that I know that we must share to one another. Let us bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, as your humble servant tonight, Lord, I pray that you give me the strength as well as the guidance, Lord. Be with my heart, be with my lips, Lord, that whatever I say may be words of comfort, words of knowledge, and words of truth that comes from you and you alone, Lord. This is my humble prayer in your precious and holy name. Amen. So the mark of the beast. We have been studying the Bible for two weeks now, specifically on Daniel and Revelation. And in Revelation, if we study the whole book and summarize it into one word, what do you think that word could be? You could just say it out of, in, in open air. What do you think that word could be? Is it, some people might say prophecy. Some people might say um, the mark of the beast. Some people might say the enemy. Some people could say the war on Daniel chapter, or Revelation chapter 12. But let's see what the book of Revelation tells us. This is now the situation that we are in. After studying Daniel and Revelation, this is where we find ourselves at. The dragon was enraged with the woman. Who's the dragon? And who's the woman? The church. So the dragon was enraged with the woman. Why was he enraged with the woman? It says he went to make war with the rest of her offsprings who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. So he's afraid or he's upset and he's enraged and he's angry at the, at the woman, the church of God, because they are worshiping God through keeping the commandments and through having the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, what does this exactly mean? Having the testimony of Jesus Christ, we have studied this sometime in the past during the week, which is focused on um, 
the spirit of prophecy. But the, knowing the spirit of prophecy, in an essence, it is actually just a way of worshiping God. When we sing to God, we worship Him. When we help others in the name of God, we worship Him. When we wake up in the morning and recognize that our lives came from God, we worship Him. At the same time, knowing the Bible and knowing the spirit of prophecy is a way of worshiping Him. So going back to this verse in Revelation 12:17. The dragon was angry with the woman because the woman was loyal to God. The woman had been keeping God's commandments and the woman had been having the testimony of Jesus Christ. Who here is proud that they know Jesus Christ? Amen. I am proud that I have Jesus Christ who not only created me, but also died for me on the cross. So this worship or rather with this, the, the dragon was angry with the woman because of worship. Remember in the beginning of earth, the dragon or Satan in the form of a serpent came to earth and deceived who? Eve. And in turn, deceiving Adam as well. And since then, the Bible tells us that the dragon had the authority and had the power over this world, which is earth. So meaning to say, the moment that Satan, the serpent, was able to hold grasp of humanity, he had the authority over this world. And he had, in himself, he believed that he had the rights of the worship of the people. But the Revelation tells us that this whole story, this whole prophecy and this whole history from the very beginning up until Jesus Christ comes is all about worship. I want to ask you, who in your heart do you worship? Are you worshiping the world? Are you worshiping yourself and what you want? Are you worshiping the deceives, the deceits of the enemy? Or are you worshiping the one and true only God, Jesus Christ. Now, in the quiz, we learned about, um, before we go there, let's look at these, these following verses. There's two of them, Revelations 14, 6 and 7, as well as 9 and 10. So two separate verses in the same chapter. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven. Actually, this is kind of like an introduction to tomorrow because tomorrow we're talking about the three angels' message. Having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, right here, to us, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Does it say that the message is only for people who speak Tagalog? No. Does it say the message is only for people in the tribe of Cavite? No. It says for every tribe, every nation, every tongue, and every people in the world. And what, did, what do they say? Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of the water. What can we notice about this? First off, let's look at the one in orange or dark orange. Fear, give glory and worship. What does it all have in common? It is something that deserving or it is something that we give that is the only one that is deserving of it is God. The only individual, the only entity that is deserving of our fear, and fear not as in we're scared of him, but rather we are in awe of him. We recognize his glory, and so we give him our, or we recognize it, we respect him, so we fear him. At the same time, we give him glory, and at the same time, we worship him. The only one that is worthy of this is God and God alone. And the ones in color red, what can we notice about this? First, there's God. Second, there's maid. And then third, there's heaven and earth. What, can, what do we know about these three things? This is the seal of God. So we worship him because he is our God, he is our creator, and he is the creator of this world. Satan may claim to have authority on this earth. 
and he may have authority in his mind of this earth, but the only one who made us is God. Imagine if an inventor comes. There was an, in, let's say there's an inventor and he creates a new invention, a very wonderful, amazing invention. And out of nowhere, someone, someone else comes to the people and say, that invention is actually mine. But you know very well that the creator of that invention is the first person. So would you believe the second person who just comes out of nowhere and claims that the invention is theirs? No. You would believe that the first person who showed you how it's made, how it works, how it functions, you would believe them that they are actually, in fact, the inventor because they have proof. So the enemy here now is trying to claim the world and trying to claim our worship. But we have been studying in the past two weeks the proofs, the proofs that there is only one God, which is our creator, God in heaven. And so the centrality of this verses is about worshiping God. These two verses talking about to worship God. Now the other two verses talks about, this is the third message. The third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if anyone worships the beast, and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink the wine of the wrath of God. And these verses simply says not to worship Satan. So there are two sides. The first one tells us to worship God. The second one tells us not to worship Satan. It's very clear. It's not saying you can choose whatever you want. It's not saying you can choose who you want to worship or how you want to worship. But it's saying you worship one and not the other. But how do we know? Because we can't really see God today. We can't really see Satan today. So tonight we're going to be talking about how we can figure out who has the mark of the beast. Who or how can we determine that the wrong entity is in charge of that certain individual or certain way of living? Now, before we go to um, the mark of the beast, we first need to review about yesterday's topic. I mean, we already had it in our quiz, which is very good, but let's just review it very quickly. The seal of God. Let's look in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 and verse 11. Remember which day? The Sabbath day, by keeping it holy. For in six days, the Lord, what did he do? Made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Did God bless the seventh day did God keep it? Did God sanctify it because he was tired for the first six days? No. Does God get tired? No. God, the Bible tells us that God has an everlasting love for you and me. That means he never gets tired of loving you and me. How much more in everything else that he's doing? Therefore, God didn't make the Sabbath day to rest for himself because he was tired. But he gave it not only for us to rest, but also to mark us with his seal. Like we have mentioned, the Lord your God is his name, his title is our creator, and his territory is here as well as in heaven. So, let's look at the beast. And these first two verses, verses 1 and 2, describes the general image of the beast. It describes what the beast looks like. And this is what John the Revelator saw. Then I stood on the sand of the sea. Then I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Does this sound familiar to you guys? We're going to look at it in a little bit. But before we go on, 
What does it mean that a beast rises up out of the sea? One thing that we need to, to notice, or one thing that we need to keep in mind, is that when we're looking at Daniel and Revelation, Daniel and Revelation is a book of what? Book of prophecy. So everything that is written in here, are, are they literal? Or are they symbolic? Symbolic. So the symbol of the sea is actually, in the Bible, the sea is a symbol of a group of multitudes or people or great numbers of people. So these, this power, this beast, now before we go on, the beast, does it represent an individual person? Or does it represent a political or a religious power? Political and religious power. So the beast being a political or religious power rises up out of the people. Okay? So this, the first thing that we, the image is that this beast is rising up out of the people. And it has seven heads, ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his head a blasphemous name. What does it say? The beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like a feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. Where did we see this image from? Last week, we learned it in Daniel chapter 7. There was the first beast, lion with eagle wings. There was another beast with the, 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 the leopards. There's another beast with the bear. And so this beast, um, not only is it like a leopard, not only is it like a bear, but it is also like a lion, meaning to say this beast is stronger than any beast that was, that was talked about in the past. So this beast is far stronger than the, all of the beasts that were talked about in the past combined together. Can you imagine such a power, so strong, that it is far stronger than the Babylonians? than the Medo-Persians, than the, the Greeks, and all those three nations combined. Can you imagine such a great power? This is how powerful this beast is. And who gave him the authority? The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Now this dragon, as we know, is the enemy, Satan. So that's, that's an image of the beast, ferocious beast. If you thought the first four beasts in the Daniel was scary, how much more is this? So, um, before we go on, I was not able to put it on the slide. But I want you to go to Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. I'd like to invite you, if you could go in your own Bibles right now, to go to Daniel chapter 12, verse 3. And let's look at what it says. 12 verse 3 says, Another sign appeared on heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having seven heads, ten horns, and seven diadems on his head. So this image, this beast, is actually identical to the dragon in Revelations chapter 12. The beast that will come out in Revelation 13 is identical to Revelations the, the dragon in Revelation chapter 12. And who gave him his power? The dragon. Okay. So, going into Revelation 13, there are six characteristics that we can find that talks about the beast. Six characteristics which we can identify who the beast is or what the beast is, rather, okay? What this political power is. Let's look at clue number one. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the, the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and a great authority. What do we know about the dragon? We know that he is... Satan. And in Revelation chapter 12, we know that the dragon made war with the woman, right? And the woman, what did the woman have? The woman had his seed, who we know is 
Jesus Christ. So the, the dragon made war with the woman and the woman's seed, which is Jesus Christ. So Satan made war with Jesus Christ. So what did Satan do? Um, there's the slide that I was looking for a while ago. Um, so what did Satan do? During Jesus' time, he used a political power, which is we know as pagan Rome, wherein a Roman official tried to kill baby Jesus. A Roman governor condemned Jesus. A Roman executioner crucified Jesus. A Roman emblem sealed Jesus' tomb when he died. And a Roman soldier guarded it. So we know from this story, the dragon made war with the woman. In other words, Satan made war with Jesus. How? Through using the Roman Empire. So what can we know about this? What else does it say? La Bianca is a, is a, a professor in a Catholic school. And he says, to the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiff in Rome. In other words, pontiff is another word for pope. So he's saying that the power of the Pope came from the power of Caesar. So here the, the Pope, which is a picture, picture of a religious power, came because a political power gave authority unto it. So here the first clue that we have is the authority of this beast. In the Bible it says that the sea beast, the one that comes from the sea, is a power given by the dragon and so we know that this beast its power came from the dragon which is we know as the pagan Rome so this is the first clue okay keep this in mind the first clue is that the authority from, from of the beast came from the dragon which is we know is pagan Rome what's the second clue let's look at revelations 13 verse 8 it says all who dwell on the earth will worship him it means that this 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 power is a power that is all over the world. It's globally. It's not just on one country. It's not just on one continent. It's not just on one region, one division, but it is all over the world. Now, as a Seventh-day Adventist, I am very proud because if I'm not mistaken, hopefully I'm not, um, if I'm not mistaken, we have been able to reach majority of the world amen we have churches um if i'm not mistaken for sure in every continent do we have a church in in antarctica um, um but we have been doing our best to reach far and wide into this world amen the bible tells us that our mission is to share the gospel in the world and we have been trying our best to do that but this beast this political religious power also will be doing the same thing. And what is that other religion power that is able to do this very thing? It is the Roman Catholic. Roman Catholic is all over the world. Um, and they are a worldwide religious power, right? So that is the second clue. The third clue can be found in Revelation 13, verse 5. This beast was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. So this beast is able to do great, say great things, but at the same time, this beast is blaspheming unto the world. What does blasphemy mean? Well, let's look at our Bible and how it, how it um, explains a blasphemy. In John 10, verse 33, some of the Jewish uh, some of the Jew, Jewish teachers, the Pharisees, they were against Jesus Christ and he wanted to stone them, or sorry, they were stoning him not for the good that his, of, sorry, we are not stoning you for any good work, but for blasphemy because you, a mere man, claim to be God. So what does blasphemy mean? Blasphemy is equaling yourself with God. A blasphemy is when someone other than God, specifically in this verse, a man, equates himself with God. So when if, if and when I say that I am God, 
then I am already blasphemy. Or if, and even when I say, the moment that I think that I could be like God, that the moment that I think I have authority over myself, I am already blaspheming against God. How much more in the Bible, how much more in the history, when certain groups, certain systems equates themselves with God? Now, I want to be very sensitive because in, I, I know I've, I've had friends in the past who left the church because of this message. And it was very difficult and it was very sad for me because they were very close friends of mine. And I tried to share the message to them. Um, I tried to bring them to the church. And it was very difficult. I, I, I grew up in the Adventist church. I don't know exactly how they would feel, how someone would feel in a way attacked. But I do know how it feels to lose a friend because of a message. But again, a message that I'm trying to share to you tonight is not a message that comes from my heart. It doesn't come from my mind. It comes from the Bible. It comes from the Word of God. It comes from God and God Himself. And so, as we continue going on, I pray that God will give us an open-minded heart wherein we will allow the Holy Spirit through work, to work through us. So going on, who claims in this world today, who claims to be like God? I know there's one in the Philippines. <laughs> um, there's one who claims like God, who used to claim that he was God or Jesus' brother, but then later on claimed to be Jesus himself. Um, but we're not going to name his name. But there's someone else who claims to be like God. Encyclical letters of Pope, Leo XIII says, We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. They're saying that them, their system, being the Pope as their leader, has the authority as God has over this world. This is um, that book wherein Words of Pope the Leo the Thirteenth is where it came from. So the first one, blasphemy, is equaling yourself with God. There's another way that we can blaspheme towards God or against God. In Mark chapter 2, verse 7, it says, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? If you were to say Mark and I were, were good friends. Mark is my brother, brother in Christ, and I, he's, I cherish him in my heart. He's a very good friend. And say, because of our good friendship, we know how each other works. We know our likes. We know our dislikes. And say, if Mark happened to do something that I dislike, if Mark happened to do something that I was not fond of. Do you think, let's, let's use Mike. You guys remember Mike from last night? Let's use Mike as our example. Do you think if Mark committed something that was bad towards me, do you think Mike could forgive Mark on my behalf? No. Do you think that Mark or Mike could say to Mark, Mark, you don't have to worry about rents because I forgive you on his behalf? Do you think that makes sense? No. It doesn't make sense at all. It should be me who would be forgiving towards Mark. And just to make things clear, there's nothing wrong going between us, okay? Um, just an example. But if ever something like that does happen, the forgiveness has to happen between us. Only between the two parties. Right? So... The Bible tells us in 1 Timothy verse two, uh, chapter 2, verse 5, that there is only one God and there is only one mediator between God and mankind, and that man is Christ Jesus. 
Now, if I sinned against God, if I broke one of his commandments, can Jesus Christ forgive me? So, uh, so I'm sinning against God. Sinning against God with his commandments. Can Jesus Christ forgive me? Yes, because Jesus Christ is equal with God. Jesus Christ is not like God. Jesus Christ is equal with God. So when we look in our lives, we don't need to worry about sinning against God. Sorry, let me rephrase that. That's not right. We do need to worry about sinning against God. But if we do fall short, if we do mess up sometimes, if we do fall, if we trip, if we do something that is not pleasing to God, and we commit our sins against Him. Aren't we glad that we don't need to go to our friends? We don't need to go to another man. We don't need to go to anyone that will tell us, you are forgiven, but we can go directly to God. Aren't we glad that God is so forgiving that we don't need to do anything? As a matter of fact, even though we are sinners, He is the one who sent Jesus Christ to be mediator for you and me. Aren't we glad that even though we are so far apart from God, that we've done plenty of things throughout our lives, that Jesus Christ still reaches and tries to reach into your heart and invite you to return to God? Aren't we glad that we have Jesus Christ? Aren't we glad that we have someone who loves us so much? So what does the Bible say? Blasphemy is being like God, a man comparing himself to God, and a man trying to forgive sins like God. But we are blessed because we have one mediator, one God, which is Jesus Christ. So the third, third um the third clue is that this beast equates itself as God. What's the fourth clue? Let's go to Revelation 13, verse 7. It was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Meaning to say they have power to overcome the people, the saints. They had the power to... to go into war, and not just get into war, but overcome them and win over them. Now there is, from the public ecclesiastical law, um, this is a generic book, not specifically by the Pope the 13th, unlike the other one a while ago, but this is the, the generic code. Some people call it um, the canonal law or code of canon. Um, it says, that the church may be divine, may by divine right confiscate the property of heretics, imprison their persons, and condemn them to flames. There are people in this world who will do, who who think that that they have the same authority of God to punish people. That they have the same authority as God to condemn people. In the same way, going back to the example with Mark and I, if, if Mark again sins against me, do you think Mike could condemn him for my behalf? No. In the same way, if I sin against God, no one else can, can condemn me on behalf of God. But only God can discipline me. We're thankful because He doesn't condemn and judge us right away, but He disciplines us. And He tells us where our wrongs and where our faults are. So the fourth clue is that this beast, not only has it authority from the pagan Rome, not only is it worldwide religious power, it equates itself with God, but it also has a persecuting power. Let's look at the clue number five. I think we've talked about this before, right, Mark? The 42 months, a little bit. Let's, let's read it, it says, Revelations 13, verse 5. And he was given a mouth 
speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority for 42 months. Now, going back to the slide a while ago, is the book of Revelations a book of literal book, or is it a symbolic book? Symbolic. So 42 months, I was not able to put it on the slide, but if you're good in math, this is the, the right time for you. 42 months, how many, in the, in the Bible, how many days are in a prophetic month? 30 days. So 30 times 42, does anyone know? 1,260. So 1,260, and in the Bible, what does a day equal to? One year. So 1,260 years, this beast, what does it say? He was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority, the same authority, wherein he, the beast, the past three things, going back, past three things, where he had religious power given by a political power, and it equates itself with God and blasphemes to be like God, this, all these things happened for 100, for 42 months, or in other words, 100, 1,260 years. Does that ring a bell to anyone? 1,260 years is the time of the Dark Ages, wherein um, the papal Rome persecuted many Christians, persecuted them, and used in all their power, forced them to go and follow their beliefs and go against God. So the fifth clue is that this beast, during the time, reigned for 1,260 years. So with this in mind, there's one more clue, but with this in mind, is the sea beast, found in the first part of Revelation 13 is still here today? What do you think? Do you think that the sea beast, because in Revelation 13, if you take a quick look at it, there's the sea beast and there's the earth beast. So there's the, earth, the sea beast that was given power by the dragon, and the sea beast reigned for 1,260 years. It reigned, aimed with the past tense. So is the sea beast still here today? No. The sea beast has already finished its reign for 1,260 years. But the thing is, this is where it gets really serious. There is another beast that comes out after the sea beast. After the dragon who fought against the woman and the woman's seed, there's the sea beast whom the dragon used to further his work. And when the work of the sea beast was done, the, the dragon was not satisfied. Therefore, there was another beast that came up. I was not able to put this on the slide, but if you would go to Revelation 13, verse 11. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. So the first one was a dragon. This one is, the second one was from the sea. This one is from the earth. He had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. Again, equaling itself with the dragon. Now, before we go to the last, last clue, I want us to picture, we have the dragon, right? And the dragon gave authority to the sea beast. And in Revelation 13, verse 12, I'm going to read it for you. It says, this land beast, he exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence. Meaning to say that this beast goes with the authority of the sea beast, which was given authority by the dragon. Now, in the Bible, is there a similar, similar picture that we can find in the Bible? 
Who is our Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ. Who sent Jesus Christ on here on earth to save you and me? God. So God sends Jesus Christ here on earth to save you and me. And what did Jesus do after he left? Who did he send in his place? The Holy Spirit. Do you see now that this power is not trying, not just trying to rule over you, but this power is trying to gain your worship when it truly belongs to God? This beast, this dragon, and the sea beast, and the land beast is an after image or a, a reflection of him, the enemy, trying to be like God. Trying to be like the most high. And so with the third, or the, the, the sixth clue, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. In Bible times, in Bible times, there is a, or in the, in the Bible, rather, not the Bible times, in the Bible, what does the number seven represent? The Sabbath. And what else does it represent? Perfection. Right? The number seven, the seal of God, represents perfection. When he made us and when he made all of creation, he ended with the seventh day to show that his creation is perfect. And now there is a beast who is coming out using people using systems in that creation, and because he didn't create it himself, what does it mean? That it is not perfect. Because it is not from the God who created perfection. And if you take something out of perfection, if it's not everything, and if you don't create it yourself, that means it's not going to be the same. Just like with the inventor analogy a while ago, if someone comes and claims an invention of someone else, if someone tells them, prove to me that you really are the inventor of this invention, and they will try to do it, they might come close, but they will never ever reach the same perfection of the original inventor was able to do. So now this image uses the number 666. Is it a literal number or is it a symbolic number? Okay. Again, in, in the book of Revelations, is, it a, is, is the book of Revelation literal or is it symbolic? Yes. Symbolic. Therefore, the number 666, it can be equated as man, but it is also symbolic in a sense that it is trying to go against the number 7, the perfect seal of God. If God gave authority to Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ sent the Holy Spirit on, a, on his behalf for us. The enemy, the dragon, also tried to send papal Rome to go against his people. When papal Rome was ended, when papal Rome was defeated and was over and was finished, papal Rome will someday, someday, not yet today, but it could be working right now. They could be preparing right now, but someday there will be a time just like the sea beast. And what happened in the sea beast? The sea beast had authority, a worldwide religious power. It equates itself with God. It is a persecuting power, and it reigned for a very long time. Meaning to say, if these are the characteristics of the sea beast, and if the Bible tells us in Revelation 13, verse 12, that the land beast will have the same authority as the sea beast, Meaning someday there will be a power, a similar power that also has authority from the pagan room. Also has worldwide religious power. Also has an equation or someone who claims that it's equal with God. Someone who has a persecuting power. Someone will reign for a very long time. And these, this beast will come someday. This beast will come someday. And it's not a matter Remember in Revelation chapter 12, the dragon made war with, um, with the woman. And, and this war is not a war, a physical war. It is a war of worship. 
mark of the beast is not something that is put on the forehead. Forehead is a symbolism of your intellectual mind. The forehead is symbolism of what you choose to do with what you know. Your frontal lobe makes all of your decisions. It affects your feelings. It affects your judgment. Therefore, when the Bible tells us that the mark will be on the foreheads, it is, in other words, saying that the mark is shown through the actions of the mind. The mark is shown through the actions of the mind which affects the hearts, which affects everything that is done. Remember the other night, Brother Mark was sharing, whoever controls the mind controls our thoughts, our actions, and our feelings. Whatever our actions or feelings are controls our character, habits. Whatever our habits are leads to our character, and whatever our character is leads to our destiny. I want to go back to, I think we're getting very late in time, but I want to go back to, hold on. We can just go in our Bibles. Let's go to Revelations. I don't think it's on the, the text. Um... Let's go, if you could go with me to Revelations 13. Revelations 13, verse 16. Hold on. Revelations 13, verse 16. It says there, He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. We talked about the forehead, the forehead being the intellectual mind, meaning to say this beast will try to rule in authority over the people by deceiving their minds. But not only by deceiving their minds, the, he will also try, this beast will also try to rule in authority over the people by their right hand. In other words, they will be forced to do so. There will be people who will be deceived through their minds, and there will be people who will be forced through their actions because they don't have a choice. But what, had the Bible, what, what has the Bible told us? about God. The Bible tells us that His seal is not something that is put on the mind. It's not something that is put on the hand. In other words, God will not try to deceive you. God will not try to force you, but He's only asking for your heart. His seal is not something that He will put and enforce on you. Only the beast will do such a thing. I want to end with a little story. Many years ago, there was a young boy named Ben Hooper. Ben was a young boy who was treated very differently. He wasn't his the people of his or the kids his age they didn't like to play with him. The reason why they didn't like to play with him was their parents told them not to. The reason why their parents told them not to is because Ben was born to a woman who was not married. Ben didn't have a father. He was born out of lust. And not only were the parents not married, but the dad also left. 
And so it was very difficult, not only for Ben, but also for his mother, because when, when his mother would take him and bring him to the grocery, to the market to buy groceries, some of the ladies would mock them and say, have you found his little daddy? Have you found where his father is? And whenever, and when, when Ben went to school, the first time, he was grade one, six years old. During recess times, he would only stay in his desk, just like every other kid would have their own desk. But instead of playing during recess, Ben would stay in his desk and either read the book, play with his toys, because the other kids wouldn't like to play with him. And then there came a time when there was a new pastor in town. This is why, this is why having an unmarried parent was a big thing, because it was a very holistic Christian community. And Ben, as much as he didn't want to be with people, as much as he didn't want to be around others, he heard about the new pastor. How the new pastor is very kind, very caring. The new pastor didn't care about your, your previous background. The new pastor would treat you the same way he would treat anyone else. And although Ben was very hesitant, he didn't want to go because he didn't want to be seen by people. This thought of thinking, this thought that someone would treat him fairly, could, it could, he couldn't help but try and, figure, or, and find out for himself. So at first, he decided, I'm going to go to church maybe 15 minutes early so that people won't notice me going in. And I'm going to leave 15 minutes early, or I will come in 15 minutes late so that people won't notice me. And I will leave 15 minutes early so that people won't notice me. And it would go on from every week to every week to every week. And by the sixth or seventh week, Ben realized how great of, uh, or rather, he didn't realize how great of a pastor this new pastor was. Because as he was listening to the pastor, he failed to realize the time. And the next thing he knew was people were already walking to go home and leaving the church. And immediately he was so, he was so flustered. It was like, oh no, people are going to notice me. People are going to know me and people are going to like talk about me again and people are going to say, where's my daddy? And so he tried to rush as fast as he could, but by the time he got to the door, there was already people blocking his way because they were also trying to leave the church. And while he was being flustered, a little hand or a hand touches his shoulder and he turned around to and to his amazement it was the pastor and the pastor asked him a very a question that he never wanted to hear in his life ever again and the pastor asked whose child are you boy and he could notice that every single person that was around them turned their attention to them feeling very awkward because it is the same thing that they've been wanting to ask him throughout this time. Where is your daddy? Where is your father? Whose child are you? But then, while he was being very flustered and very awkward and embarrassed, the pastor chalantly smiles. And the pastor says, Oh, I know whose child are you. I know whose family you belong in. And it is a family that, that is very loving. It is a family that is very kind. It is a family that is very lovable. I know who your dad is. Your dad is God. And you belong in his family. And you belong in this family in the church. You see, there will come a time, there will come a time when religious power will work with a political power. When there will come a time when there is a full of distress similar to today where there's a pandemic going on, there's many hurricanes going on, there's many things, there are many bad things are going on, and relig a religious power, this beast, a religious power, will work with a political power to try and work together and have world peace. 
But out of this world, peace will come. Out of this world, peace will come these awful signs that has happened in the past. If we look at the beginning of our time in Adam and Eve, Satan tried to pull Adam and Eve away from God. If we look at the story of Noah, people were so focused on themselves that they failed to realize Noah calling them for God. If we look in the story of Daniel, King Nebuchadnezzar believed that the, that the image he saw was a worldly political power, and so he said, you either worship this image or you die. If we look in the New Testament, in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ was teaching them about the world, about, about how the kingdom of God will come and he will take us all home. But even then, there were other works. The pagan Rome crucified Jesus Christ. Even after Jesus Christ left, we look at the disciples, most of them, I think only one of them, died a peaceful death. But everyone else died a horrible death because of their belief in Christ. If we look in our history, there's a story of the Waldensians who were very committed to the Bible. And, and a group of people persecuted them because of their belief. If we look at the 1260 years of Dark Ages, it may be over now, but someday a similar story will happen and it will affect you and me. And now the question is, during these times, it was about a question of worship. The same question is being asked to you right now. Would you worship the one mediator, the one God, Jesus Christ? If you want to worship him, if in your heart you believe and you claim that you will ask God to give you the power to not be swayed, even if the world will try to crucify, to persecute you. I invite you to stand up tonight as you're claiming Jesus Christ will be with you until the day he returns to bring us home. And I will pray for you and we will pray together and we will invite him and the Holy Spirit that this message will not just be a message for tonight, but a message that we will remember for the rest of our lives until Jesus returns. Heavenly Father, Lord, we have learned a very serious topic tonight, Lord, and very scary one at that too. Lord, just like the little boy, Ben, at times he didn't wanna go to church because the people was judging him. The people were judging him, Lord. But he knew in his heart that he had to find out if this pastor was really nice. And because of this, Lord, he found out not only about the pastor, but he also found out about you. I believe the same way tonight, Lord, that we are here because we want to learn more about you. And that we are here because you are preparing us for someday where the same judgment the same persecution, the same, the same criticism, the same hate throughout the past history, we will also experience a similar and same thing, Lord. And when that time comes, Lord, I pray for myself and for my brothers and sisters that, Lord, we will claim the promise that you are our God and that you are the true worshiper. You are the one who is truly deserving of this, Lord. Not anything else, but only the seal of God, which is your seventh-day Sabbath. So help us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit to be able to live and to be able to trust in you, to be able to follow you, to be able to be committed to you, to be loyal to you, and we cannot wait, Lord, for you to return to bring us home. But until that day comes, Lord, please be with each and every one of us. This is our humble prayer in your precious and holy name. Amen.